Hello, everyone, and welcome to Advocacy 101. This is Esther Lopez with the Council on Alcohol and Drugs, and we are very thankful that each of you have joined us today. Um, we have Sue Saul with us from CADCA. Sue is a public policy consultant representing the Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America. She is nationally recognized for her advocacy and legislative accomplishments on behalf of the substance abuse prevention field. She has an extensive background in public policy and has held high positions at the federal, state, and local levels. She, is, she was a budget examiner and a legislative analyst at the Office of Management and Budget in the office in the executive office of the president for over 10 years. Sue was driving was a driving force behind the passage, reauthorization, and full funding of the Drug Free Communities Act. In addition, Sue has worked to save and enhance funding for all federal substance abuse prevention and treatment programs over the last two decades. I've had the pleasure of hearing Sue speak several times at CACA conferences, and can I, I can assure you, we are in for a real treat. Not only is Sue a subject matter expert, her enthusiasm and passion for this work is very contagious. So thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much, and it's truly a pleasure and an honor for me to be able to speak to you about a subject that is truly near and dear to my heart. So I'm really going to be talking about how to be an effective advocate and some tips and tools for changing policy. So um, there's something I call a policy radar screen. Um, you know, usually it's a bad thing to be on a radar screen. It means that you're driving too fast and the police are probably going to pull you over and give you a ticket. But in the public policy arena, it's actually extremely important to get on the radar screen of elected officials because in reality, our field is competing with every other major program and issue that governments deal with. So anything from dealing with China, nuclear waste disposal, global warming, and then substance use prevention. So if we're not on what I'm going to call policy radar screen, we can't affect change because nobody's going to actually understand who we are, what we do, or what we're looking to change. So how does an issue get on the policy radar screen? It involves what I'm going to call the three Bs. You need to have organized people who are vocal, who are visible, and what I'm going to call our valuable constituency. So people need to be willing to be forceful enough to actually do what it takes to put their agenda on the top of elected officials' radar screen. So what does it mean to be vocal? Obviously, it means doing exactly what you guys are going to be doing in your state capital. It means speaking up about the issues that you're facing in your community, as well as the successes and outcomes that you've had, and then talking to them about what it is that you're looking for them to help you with and why. Uh, what does it mean to be visible? It means a whole bunch of people need to show up in court um, on the same day at the same time um, with some identifying thing that ties them all together, whether it's a backpack, everybody wearing red t-shirts, whatever it is, we need to be visible so people know that we're a force. And then what does it mean to be valuable? To me, it means that we're going to show our value through sharing what we do, why it matters, and how we know it matters, which is usually being able to show some sort of outcomes from the baseline that because of your work, either something like academic achievement, um, got better or something that's negative, like substance use, um, got better as well. So that went, went down. Um, so being valuable also means working with elected officials as a partner and giving them information that they might not know of otherwise and building a relationship with them. Okay. So why does this all matter? Because unless we're visible, vocal, and can show that we're valuable, um, we're not going to be able to affect change because nobody is going to know who we are and what we want. So I know that in general, you guys are talking about advocacy as an umbrella, and then sort of two things under the umbrella are lobbying and education. So I'm going to start with explaining what lobbying so lobbying is taking a specific position on a specific piece of legislation. So what does that mean? It means going in and saying, I want you to support the following bill because or I oppose any legislation that would legalize marijuana because that's taking a specific position on a specific piece of legislation. And that is so that we should lobby. So should 501c3 
is be afraid to lobby? The answer is no. As a 501c3, and I don't know how many of you on the call are 501c3s or work for 501c3s, um, you're allowed to lobby, but there are certain rules that you have to follow, and I'm going to go into them for a minute. So, 501c3s that are going to participate in actual lobbying, so taking specific positions on specific pieces of legislation, um, have to follow certain guidelines. And um, so basically, I'm going to get to the guidelines in a minute. Sorry about that. Not in the 100% right order. Um, so if your organization is solely funded with federal dollars, can you educate the elected officials? So this, this is where um, I'm going to get into the difference between education and lobbying. Yeah, you can go in and you can educate elected officials about the issues you're facing, how you know that they're issues, share your data, um, educate them about problems that are happening because of certain substances. You can go as far as telling them what you think the answer is. As long as you're not taking a specific position on a specific piece of legislation. So, yes, yeah, that's education. So, if your organization receives a mixture of federal and non federal funds, can you lobby? And by non federal, I don't mean state, I mean um, funds that um, come from sources other than, than government. So, we call those non restricted funds. So, under IRS guidelines, 501c3s can use up to 20%. Of their organization's first 500,000 in head expenditures to actually lobby, which is to take specific positions on specific pieces of legislation. But you can't use any of your federal funds to lobby. So this shows first 500,000. Someone could spend 100,000 on lobbying, but most of the people in our field, most of their funds come from the federal and state government. And so even you can't use any of that to lobby, that's a little bit of a conundrum. So if your 501c3 chooses to lobby, we recommend that you fill out an IRS form, which you don't have time to really do if you've never done it before your, your whole day in the state house. But um, filing does provide pretty liberal limits on how much money can be spent on lobbying. Um, you can skip the next slide, Chris. Um, so I, I want to go into some activities that are not considered lobbying under federal tax law. Um, so these are considered education or advocacy. You can certainly meet with the legislator to talk about social problems such as marijuana, e-cigarettes, chewing, vaping, whatever you want to talk about without mentioning a specific legislative proposal. You can provide a legislator with all kinds of educational materials about a specific piece of legislation if you don't ask them to take any specific action on that legislation. You can respond to a written request from a legislative committee or subcommittee for information about a specific piece of legislation. Keep going, Chris. You can track activities of legislators, including votes, positions taken, contributions accepted, produce and disseminate research reports, studies that provide nonpartisan analysis on any of the issues. You can talk to the media about specific legislative proposals as long as you don't take a position on them. Um, you can advocate for better enforcement of existing laws, uh, such as controlling alcohol sales to minors. Those are already on the books. Um, you can advocate for the enactment and enforcement of private or voluntary policies, such as alcohol purchase restrictions in stadiums. And you can conduct public education campaigns to affect the opinions of the general public, but you have to be very careful that there's no ballot initiative pending because at that point the uh, the public becomes the legislature and that at that point it's considered funding. So advocacy slash education can and should be done by everyone. You just have to be very careful if you mostly have restricted funds that you go off as an individual on your own time uh, and speak as a public, you know, as a public health expert or prevention expert, but don't necessarily, if you're going to move into taking positions, do it in your official capacity. Um, so I'm going to take a minute here to go through what I'm going to call a power analysis. And I think you guys know what you're going to be asking for when you go up to the state house. So I'm going to go through this pretty quickly, but 
basically you have to know what you want to change. You have to document the extent of the problem with facts and figures and anecdotes and cite your sources so that people understand what the issue you're trying to deal with is. Obviously, you're going to the state legislature, so you're going to want them to make changes that they're capable of making through passing state laws. Um, you have to fully understand the legislative process in the state. And then you really need to use your opportunities in the visits you have um, in the Capitol to find some important champions in the legislature on the right committees that can help you get the pieces of legislation you're looking or introduced or held up if you have problems with some of them. And when it comes to making those specific ads, make sure someone in your group actually can lobby because that's when you're crossing over the line from educating and bringing up an issue and explaining why it's important to actually asking them to champion something that's sort of an move across the line to lobby. So you have to figure out who you're going to um, ask to help you recruit in your champions. Usually it's people that have worked with the member before, that live in their district, that have donated money to them, that they're aware of. Um, that's the best way to get champions is to use people who are their constituents, a lot of those people are you, to do that. And so obviously you're going to take stuff to make your case, charts, graphs, stats, everything should be on one page and very clear. They don't read big reports. If you have a big report, it has to have a one page summary that you can see the time. So, your State Advocacy Day, I think, is a fabulous opportunity for all of you to meet with your members of the Georgia Legislature and or their staff to educate them. And I want to just say here, staff of elected officials, staff members, are extremely important. They're the people who have the issue area that they work on, in this case, would be drug prevention. They're the experts in the office. The elected official is usually the generalist, so don't be upset if you end up meeting with a staffer because in the end, they're the ones that bring the ideas for legislation. They're also the ones that usually draft it to the members. Great to meet with the member themselves. Always make sure you're meeting with the right staff person. So your day in the Georgia State Legislature is really an opportunity to tell your elected officials at the state level um, who you are, what program you work on, the successes and outcomes your program achieved, the issues you face, and how you think state laws should be changed to address them. And I would definitely be very clear about any state program that funds your program um, because they need to be aware of those. So when the state appropriations process happens, they're going to be looking out for what funds you. So can one really make, if one's meeting really make a difference? The answer is absolutely yes. I know at the federal level, at CACA, on our Capitol Hill Day, we have thousands of people going up to the Hill, and every major champion we have ever had has been a result of local people going to talk to their elected representatives and making the case for why what they're doing, why it's really important, and being compelling enough that we've ended up with every champion we've ever had on Capitol Hill in Washington as a result of our Capitol Hill thing. So yes, one meeting can really make a difference. But you really need to go into these meetings very prepared, and I'm sure that um, that's what the council is going to be doing with you. So given all politics really is local, you're very important as a constituent. You vote for these guys. Your jobs depend on people like you continuing to keep them in office. You also have really important information to provide because you guys are the experts on substance use prevention. You know the facts, you know what's going on, and they don't. So if you don't tell them what's going on, they're going to have really no way of knowing. And the radar screen thing, other issues and other people will get in and make their case, so we have to do the same thing. So every member of the state legislature can help us, but in order to have the biggest impact, it's really critical that as many members of your state legislature hear from their constituents on the day that you guys are going up. And um, I think it's very important to bring one page to highlight the specific program to fund your work, and then go on to explain why the work you do is so critically important and how it makes a difference. 
so that they, they understand who you are, what you do, and what sources of funding provide the money for you to do it. So all members of uh, the Georgia legislature, I think, need to understand through your meeting that there really is an urgent need to focus more resources and efforts on stopping substance use before it ever starts. I think there's really a misunderstanding during the opioid epidemic that people just start using opioids um, and then they move on to heroin. And the issue is we all know most youth initiate with alcohol, marijuana, and at this point, e-cigarettes, um, more kids are using e-cigarettes even than marijuana, according to Monitor in the Future. You guys have your own state data. But the opioid epidemic can't successfully be addressed without a much higher emphasis on stopping all substance use before it starts. So pushing out the age of initiation when people start using any substance really is the key to this whole thing. And it hasn't been a legislative or a funding priority to date at the federal level, and I doubt that it has in Georgia either. So I think we really do need to make the case that stopping the pipeline to addiction by delaying first use of all substances is probably the way to go. So how do you prepare for your meeting? You're going to set your agenda ahead of time. You're going to designate one person to be the primary spokesperson for the meeting. If you have multiple people in meetings, make sure you keep your introductions really short. Um, I have a great story about the first meeting I did on Capitol Hill when I took my job here during lobbying for this issue. And we had a half an hour with a member and everyone I brought to the meeting spent so much time explaining how important they were that we never actually got to say anything about why we were there to meet these people. They knew we were very important they had no idea what we wanted or why we were there. So make sure that everybody keeps their introductions to a minimum and make sure your primary spokesperson has the right to cut people off if they want to move. Then tell your members and or the staff room that you're meeting with what your program or coalition does, who you're involved with, who you serve, what it is that you do for these people, what issues you address in the community, how you do it, and then you need to highlight your outcomes and successes, hopefully um, with actual outcomes and reductions from a baseline in um, alcohol, tobacco, or other drug use. Or if you have process measures, how many people you've served, um, that would be important to share as well. Okay. Um, so, template for your state advocacy uh, day handout. I think everybody should have some sort of a template for a one-pager that shows your outcome, who you are, who you work with in the community. Um, that's not my job to provide that, but um, it would be a good thing if everybody who was going had some sort of a one-pager. Um, this is just an example of one from the Drug for Communities program. And obviously, the, the blue lines are um, middle school and the orange lines are high school and these are reductions between 2013 and 2017 in 30-day um, use of prescription drugs and you can see in the orange line is gigantically reduced. The blue line is two. And so this is a visual that will show somebody these guys, whatever they did, really worked because they have really amazing reductions in 30-day prescription drug use among middle and high school students. The next thing is don't just have the meeting be the end of the relationship. This is the beginning of building a relationship if you haven't met your member before. And if you have, thank them for any support that they have given you in the past. Also, at the end of the meeting, be sure to thank the legislature. Well, anyway, thank anyone who's helped you in the past, and I guess I'm going to then say end the meeting and continue the relationship. You all have really good information, data, um, that these guys could benefit from in making decisions. So become a source of information and really a good resource for your elected official. Um, and it's up to you to continue to cultivate and grow this relationship. So become an ongoing source of information and data for your member. And if you want to, get your member involved locally. Invite them to a big event where they can give on the front page of the local newspaper. And then awards they've been really helpful. Um, but it's really important that these 
not be one shot needed. And it's also important you don't bug these people to death. But there's no reason that you can't ask if it can be a source of information. And then email the staff for things that you think are of interest or that would be opportunities for these guys to participate in local events. Offer yourself in your program as a continuing local resource on substance abuse issues. Ask the members interested in working with you on a town hall meeting. Um, a lot of times they really are, and then give members an award or some sort of recognition. Elected officials would love to have their pictures in the newspaper with kids and with other people. So, what do you do after your meeting and you go back home? One, you send a thank you note to everyone you met with, and also reiterate what it is you met with them about what you guys are asking them to do. And concluding thoughts here are really. Your state legislative advocacy day is a real unique opportunity for you to make a difference because by educating your the members of your Georgia congressional delegation, you can help translate your local successes into statewide successes, and you can also raise issues that they might not be aware of that they really need to pay attention to and do some legislation on. So your members need to hear from you on your legislative advocacy day as well as throughout the entire year. Sue, thank you so much for sharing all this information. This is all very helpful as we prepare for our advocacy day. Um, as a reminder for everyone that's on the call, we are having our Substance Abuse Prevention Advocacy Day on February 21st from 10 to 2.